VAR needs some explaining. A stunning record is broken. Barca fall short. We've got a transfer roundup and this week's great debate all coming up in the next few minutes as I'm your host, Matt Froelich. You are the one footballers and this is the Daily News. First off, and there really needs to be some talk about VAR because I'm not quite sure what's going on and I'm not sure many other people are. So last night, VAR was in use in the Champions League, but it seemed that not many referees actually decided to use it. I'm talking mainly about the penalty decision which went against Liverpool last night. And Andy Robertson was the judge to have brought down Jose Callejon, but on second looking, it doesn't really look like there was too much contact. Basically, I think the rule goes that if the referee makes a call based on something like contact, then VAR can't get involved because it's his decision at the end of the day. They're only there to talk about obvious refereeing errors. But my question is, if he saw the contact and then didn't give it, would VAR then come back and say there was actually contact? Surely this can't be fair that it works one way and not the other. The same thing goes for Mason Mount's injury for Chelsea. He was absolutely nailed and there should have been a sending off for the Valencia midfielder, Coquelin, but nothing actually happened. On the other side, though, it was used elsewhere. VAR was used to overrule decisions or keep decisions correctly, much like Timo Werner's second goal for RB Leipzig. I'm not so sure why there is still such a grey area. And even when managers talk about it after the game, I think they should just keep silent because they're going to look foolish. Jurgen Klopp obviously spoke about it after the match saying he wasn't too happy, but then again, it did help Liverpool in the Champions League final last season. Pep Guardiola's the same. He came out and said how bad it was at the beginning of this season, but then it helped him last season. Honestly, coaches, players, everyone should just get used to the fact that sometimes it's going to go for you and sometimes it's going to go against you because you can't do anything about it now and it looks like VAR is here to stay. But what VAR can't be blamed for is the fact that Liverpool lost 2-0 against Napoli. They were much better than they were last year when they visited Naples, but things aren't so bad just yet. Yes, they did lose 2-0 in their first game and whilst trying to retain the Champions League trophy, but it's the first game of the group stage. And in all honesty, without disrespect to Genk and Salzburg, who we'll get on to in a minute, away at Napoli is the hardest game of the group for Liverpool. So the fact they've got it out of the way first, and even though they've lost, I'm pretty sure that they'll definitely be favourites for the next five games in the group stage. If they win all of those, which I'm expecting them to do, 15 points will probably get them top of the group, if not at least second. They'll definitely be through to the next round. So things could be worse. As for Virgil van Dijk's mistake, so what? He made a mistake. He's still brilliant. Everyone get over it. But moving on and to an unbelievable record and talking of Salzburg, Erling Braut Haaland is their main striker because he managed to bag a hat-trick in the Champions League last night. This means that he has 17 goals in nine games for his new club since joining from Molde. So with that goal-scoring record in mind, he also became the first player to score a hat-trick on his Champions League debut in the first half and only the third player to score a hat-trick on his debut behind the likes of Wayne Rooney and Raul. Some unbelievable scenes and considering he scored a hat-trick at the weekend as well, he is probably Europe's most informed striker. Now if you didn't recognise the name, that's because a few of you may remember his father, Alfinger Haaland, who played in England with the likes of Leeds, Nottingham Forest and Manchester City. He was actually the player who was on the receiving end of Roy Keane's frustration who booted in one of his knees and pretty much ended his career. An early retirement for him, but his son is doing the family name very, very proud. I'm literally giving it two, three days maximum before he's linked with Manchester United. I'm not just saying that because they get linked with everyone, although I kind of am, but also because Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was actually his manager at Mulder last season, at the beginning at least. But this isn't the 19-year-old's first foray into the goal-scoring exploits as over the summer in the Under-20 World Cup, he did put nine goals past Honduras. Nine goals in one game in which Norway won 12-0. I know you're going to talk about the quality of the opponent, but still, to bag that many goals is ridiculous. As for what it meant, well, Salzburg now top that group after a thrashing 6-2 win over Genk and it means that Liverpool will have to be aware of him when they welcome him and the team to Anfield in a few weeks time on match day two. So next up adds the return of Lionel Messi which we spoke about yesterday. He was only on the bench of Barcelona but was chucked on by Valverde to try and find a winner and now I'm finally kind of seeing why so many people want Ernesto Valverde out of Barcelona? I'll be the first to back him up and say he's won the trophies in the last few seasons. But there have been lots of you commenting in the comments section saying tactically he's not really adept and he's not playing the players in the right position or giving the players any motivation. Last night, I definitely saw that. If it wasn't for the brilliance of Testegen in goal, saving that Royce penalty was fantastic, I honestly thought that Dortmund should have won and Barcelona were looking very, very lackluster. In fact, just throwing Messi on and hoping he'd produce something really, really sums 
comes out Valverde in recent weeks. Their start to the season in La Liga has been quite poor and it really, really told last night that things aren't all right at Barcelona. The only reason it was a good point is because somehow Inter Milan drew with Slavia Prague and only just by scoring in the 92nd minute. It means that every team in that group is now on one point and, well, Barcelona can thank their lucky stars that they are having to play catch-up at this early stage. Elsewhere in the Champions League, and Ajax post De Jong and De Ligt off to a fine start with a 3-0 victory against Lille. Timo Werner bagged a brace as Leipzig put Benfica to the sword and Valencia managed a fantastic 1-0 victory at Chelsea. Frank Lampard's debut as a manager in the Champions League didn't go as planned and the quabble between William Jorginho and Ross Barkley ended in Barkley missing the penalty that they were arguing over. Again, like I mentioned before, players miss penalties. That's just how it goes. If he'd smashed it in, no one would be talking about it. Well, people would because Chelsea would have got a well-deserved point. Anyway, Valencia now are in a pretty good position considering all their troubles recently with sacking their manager. Well, that's a fantastic victory for them. So next up, we move to the transfer roundup slash the daily roundup of just regular other news. First off, the former Spanish legend Xavi says that Raheem Sterling is winning the race to be the third best player in the world behind Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Wayne Rooney really thinks players in the MLS should be paid more. Barcelona are willing to offer Ansu Fati, who didn't actually have the best of games last night, but he's only 16, a new five-year deal after his great start to the season. And in today's bullshit rumour, it's not even a rumour, it's just absolute nonsense. Cristiano Ronaldo mentioned that he was one step away from signing for Arsenal in 2003. So what? He didn't. It would have been great if Arsenal had him. Cristiano Ronaldo may not have been the same player, but that doesn't exactly help the Gunners now. I'm really sure that no one is actually interested who might have joined where or gone where, especially almost 16 years ago. It's not really relevant. But away from that, and finally, we come to this week's great debate where the One Football Newsroom posed a question to you guys. Of course, later in the day, you can check out the relevant article in the app to find out all of their answers and my answer. But for this question and in the comments section, we want to know... What is your greatest starting eleven for the Champions League this season? There is one stipulation. You can only pick one player per club. So if those of you put those Liverpool, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, whoever players in there, it doesn't really count. Just one player per club. So for me, I've gone with Jan Oblak in goal, a back three of Koulibaly, Van Dijk and Sergio Ramos. A midfield of Sterling on the right, Kante and Kimmich in the middle with Hyung Min Son on the left. And a front three of Kylian Mbappe, Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Don't know about you guys, that is an unbelievably good team. If you could put that together somehow, it would cost a lot, but I'm pretty sure they would win the Champions League. You've got the defensive midfield covered, you've got flying attackers, just brilliant. So of course, let me know your thoughts on the great debate down below and on the rest of the day's daily news in the Champions League. Are you delighted that it is back? I definitely am. Whilst you're there, you can also smash the like button and click here or here to check out all of the other videos we've got going on on OneFootball. But until next time, I will see you guys later.